So this is just like Sunday supper at my house. We hang out like this, we talk a little stuff about business, then we really get down to what we're looking for. Um, the question for the general cast is, what initially attracted any of you to this project? Do you actually like food? <laughs> Very much. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it turned out that we were all pretty into food by coincidence, and, um, and were kind of around this incredible food as we were cooking, and we were being fed it. So that was a huge perk of doing this film. And actually the cast, the fact that uh, it was always going to be conceived of, of a, a, as an international cast was a very alluring that we shot it in London. Um, that was a really cool aspect and very true to kitchens, as you know. You know, there's always tons of different languages going on and right. it, was, it was a really awesome aspect of it. Did you learn anything, um, in all of the intensive practice, was there anything that you learned as either a maitre d', a chef, a, a cooker, or a critic that, uh, that you were surprised by or, or otherwise perplexed? Or was it also obvious, or are there nuance that you guys understood or start to capture? Well, I, I was attracted by that film because I opened a restaurant myself five years ago. It, what I learned is that we are very far away from getting a Michelin star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the perfection, uh, the, 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 the level of, uh, you know, the, the, the quality in, 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 in this restaurant where I was trained uh, at Marcus Waring's restaurant in London is just incredible. Right. Yeah. And it's fastidious. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you did a very good job of capturing kind of the exasperation with the talent and yet your complete faith behind it, which was mm -hmm. evident without being so spoken so often. So it was mm -hmm. really very real because that's how the front of the house treats a lot of us cooks in the back <laughs> of the time. It's like, yeah, all right, have your little fit, but come on, come on. You did great that way. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. I was, I was really you. interested in it. So um, in terms of uh, being the critic, Uma, you walked in with the brilliant and su supercilious way that I imagine you go into a lot of places. And, and when they bow down to you, you did such a great job. Was it, was it hard to pretend to be a critic or was it a natural thing? No, I mean that because when you're talking about food, she talked about food in the right way. It wasn't like it was just like blah, blah, blah. Um, well, it was just a lot of fun to, the cast was already assembled to join everybody. But uh, no, I, I liked the, the, the exasperation with Twitter and Yelp. Um, I thought that was funny. Um, the idea that the, the, the irritation that the, the crowds, um, the popular demand was over, over superseding um, opinion. Right. Um, I, what, do you feel, uh, this question is good for you actually as a professional in the arena. Did, did, did we capture the... Uh... Well, completely, because the pressure is so on and as much as the social media forms a lot of the general opinion. It's still the main critic of the New York Times or of the London Standard or the papers that people read that really give you your, your bona fides. Like you can have a lot of Yelps and people are like, mm, yeah, whatever, those are all your cousins and we know it. And, 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 and that doesn't diminish the value of Yelp to a consumer who's traveling around the world. But when you have four stars here or three stars in Michelin, you, you can, it's kind of like, F you to anybody who ever challenged you as a critic, like you, or as a chef. You can say, look, whatever you think, here's the paper of record saying exactly what matters to us. So that's a really big part of our business. Um, and as the young chefs try to figure out how they're part of the piece, Sam, your character is a testament to just how hard they've got to work and, and how much apparent suffering they have to do. do, you, do, you, do, do was that part of your, your situation? Yeah, I guess so. I, was, you know, I spent a lot of time in Marcus Waring's restaurant in the Barclay and studied one chef in particular and kind of just kind of watched him and, and learned his story and about where he came from. And these guys are in it because they're so passionate, you know, because they work insane hours, obviously, as you know, and, you know, for very little money and because they just want to get it right, you know, and they love the food and, and the whole thing behind it. And um, I studied this one guy, Jake, who was younger than me, but was Marcus's like right hand man. He would run the kitchen when Marcus wasn't around and it was just fascinating to see. Oh, yeah, he was like, yeah, he was, yeah, he was like really kind of like quiet kind of kid, yeah. but when he switched it on, he was just this animal in the kitchen, you know. Um, but yeah, they're all covered in burns and, you know, slash marks from knives and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Still have them even yeah. now. <laughs> just every so, now and then something tricky can happen. Yeah. Well, so did you, um, in, the, in the screaming and passionate scenes that Bradley did so well, mm. um, how, did it feel like you were being yelled at, guys? 
Well, yeah. Good, I mean, Sienna mostly <laughs> for that embarrassing turbo situation. <laughs> um, did it? Did I mean, you guys are actors, so you know what's going on. But how how did that capture anything in the Waring kitchen? I imagine he's a little calmer than maybe our script led everyone to believe. Is that true? He probably has his moments, but it has leveled out. Right. I think he can definitely go there. Well, I think what happens as chefs mature, they realize that yelling is not the most effective way to change the behavior of the people that are working with you. And in fact, a quiet lecture delivered sotto voce, yet within earshot of the people that you work with, might shame you more into quickly. Because when I yell at it, or when I used to yell at someone, I would always have to go back and apologize, because I felt like an idiot. <laughs> and then, of course, I've diminished everything I just yelled about to a whimpering little apology, and gee, you're doing okay anyway. So effectively, the yelling was such a crucial part of it. I mean, Bradley, you felt pretty jacked up about it because you did the throw pretty well on that. Mm. Did you talk to Marco about that, Marco Pierre White at all about that? Uh, I did, yeah, and, and Marcus and, uh, and, and Claire Smythe at uh, Hospital Road right. and, uh, and Gordon. Ramsey. So I had, I had a, and just watched. Who was so. actually the PhD student of all PhD students <laughs> of yelling chefs, right? But what's so interesting, I just love the family of it all because you worked under Marco, so did Gordon, and so right. did Marcus. Right. So, you know, and, and, you know, I think Marco, and he will say it openly, has changed a lot over the years and has calmed down a lot. Um, but no, there's tons of stories, which you know more than anybody, of, uh, you know, that's, I think the movie was actually pretty tame. Well, compared to Marco's worst days, yes. Yeah. But I think it captured probably more the 21st century vibe, right? Yes. I mean, that was yes. 1985. Right. And, you know, Marco would literally take scissors and cut guys' chef coats right. up while they were on them just to diminish, like, right. you don't deserve this, snip, 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 yeah. snip. Like, what crazed mind comes up with this yeah. way yeah. of torturing people in such a cool thing? And yet the pressure and the intensity when the Michelin Guide is in there, I think without wrecking the movie, there's a scene where there's some sabotage that is so well done and so well thought out that it's just like, wow, that's a payoff that I yeah. thought was great. And also, I always thought that, you know, the, the, um, how erratic that the, the Adam character comes in the kitchen, it's all, it's all geared towards himself. I mean, it really is all, he, he, it's all based in self-loathing that he screwed it up. Well, right, and that's fundamentally why chefs yell, because they realize they didn't train their staff properly. The reason they're mad is because they should have known to train them for the inevitable fact that at 7.30 you have to move much faster than you do at 5.30, and you have to accept a window of acceptable variation. And if you don't do that, you're mad at them, but it's, they're just like 17-year-old kids or 22-year-old kids. You have effed up, right. and you feel so bad about it, you're lashing at everybody they can. How was the food on set? Unbelievable. Like you ate their real food? Oh, the cook. The, well, I mean, we were cooking. I mean, that we were cooking in the way that they set it up. Uh, Marcus created the dishes, and then we would have recipes. The meals were all set by the commies, and then all of the other cooks were. Commies actually, are not Soviets. They're the lesser <laughs> level of chefs. <laughs> all the other cooks, they were not extra actors. They were they were cooks that people that work in Michelin star restaurants around London. So we were cooking the food. So we were eating the food too. And Ricardo tasting it. Was, oh yeah, all the time. We were testing constantly, but then we would actually in between takes eat a lot of the meat. Uh, Ricardo was just doing brilliant work in the grill. So did anybody take home any recipes that they're gonna cook at their house now? I, I yes, turbot, or turbo. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, will be, I have eaten much more turbot than I ever thought I would and can fillet it, which is exciting. Right. So I can buy a whole one and take it home, and that's like an, a good new skill. And also, I can make pasta. So I've been making. You did an amazing scene pasta. where you were rolling yeah. it out with such a plum. I'm like, she knows yeah, she how really to do that. this, yeah. man. Exactly. She really did that in the scene. Yeah. yeah, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. Yeah, it really Fun. was. It People was have no idea how hard that is to act number one, but then make pasta while you're acting. <laughs> <laughs> well, because yeah. at that point she wasn't acting; she was just making. Yeah, just I was just being man. And that <laughs> <laughs> but that was the sort of uh, wonderful thing for all of us is that we were actually got to do the work, and that's for an actor. Yeah. That that's always the, the easiest right. thing if, if you're actually doing it. Well, so when the act, when the chefs that were actually helping you execute the mise en place, yeah. Were they the same ones every day, or were they... Same like, ones. Oh, yeah. so they didn't have a job for a month. That's no. right. Like, they worked right. only they with came. you. Yeah. Oh, it felt wow. like a real brigade. Yeah. Well, that's exactly yeah. what a real yeah. kitchen feels yeah. like. And everybody got to know each other. And for example, when we had that scene where Adam berates everybody, you know, they're all there. Right. You know, and it really was... And good. they're like, yes, yes. <laughs> somebody else is taking it right now. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, because when, that's, when that stuff goes on, <laughs> that's all you're really thinking about, is you're just trying to get as close to the corner and as away right. from the center of attention as possible. Of course. Because, I mean, obviously, when, everyone make, when someone makes a mistake, the whole kitchen pays for it. 
How uh, much of uh, awareness do you now have in a dining experience when you're sitting at a restaurant table? Like, will you ever, when you see, like, here's what happens in my family. We'll finish our appetizers, and, and we'll be done. And for five minutes, they'll watch us. And then a busboy will come up surreptitiously, quietly, getting ready to clear the table. And for some strange reason, my wife or my son picks a little something up off the plate. And the whole team has to back back out again. Because you can't clear the table while they're still eating. Yeah. So do you ever notice anything about that in restaurants when you're going around? The thing that I heard that was, like, was the most extraordinary thing was that if, if you're a table, obviously, of people, five of you, and you've ordered different things, and your main courses are ready, and they're on the pass, if someone from that table stands up to go to the bathroom and it takes more than two minutes, every dish has to be thrown away. Chucked. So I just now, if I'm at a dinner table and there are people, I'm like, if we've had, our, if we're waiting, you do not leave the table. You just don't go. Right. That was like. Well, I mean, in New York now, because you have to go like 400 yards away from the restaurant to have a cigarette. Like right. it could be a oh, month yeah. before they come back yeah. when you're waiting for the entree. <laughs> and true. like you know, like a delicate That's piece true. of fish can't hold on two minutes. Certainly, a, a ravioli can't either. Like right. you got to throw it out and restart yeah. it. And yeah. It's, it's a, I never thought about the smoking thing. You're right. Oh, this got to oh, be a nightmare. They, yeah. But they go so far away. Yeah, it's got to be Because we nightmare. make them go so far right, away. Right, right. <laughs> like, yes, you have to go to Washington Square Park, the very center. <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly smoke in front of this. My guests are very upset with you. <laughs> so now what do you think about when you have to wait a few more minutes at a reservation? Uma. You guys <laughs> never wait for reservations. <laughs> Not with you, Mario. Excellent. Perfect. Well done. But is there any sympathy toward the situation? I mean, you guys have seen it now from a very different way. I would say that among the people at this table, all of you are, are, have, and any of my restaurants have always been incredibly respectful and most delightful. So you're welcome back at any time. Thank you. But there are people that throw a little fit, and they tend not to be the famous people. They tend to be the entitled people. Have you ever seen anything like that in a restaurant? And will you ever, in the, in, in the restaurant's defense, come up to them and say, please? It'd be weird to get involved at that point. Right. <laughs> like, it would be like weird. a complete stranger. But like they definitely get a bad look. Right. That's good. That's good enough. That's good enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen it. But I remember when I was a kid, I remember being at a seafood restaurant and then um I was I was the guy who actually did it to me, the, I was a prep cook and then he asked me what I put in the crab cakes. And I didn't what understand what he was saying. And I was like, well, Aww. because he really wanted me to say as many ingredients as possible to tell me that my crab cakes weren't well made. Because the more you put in them, right. the worse it is. Anything besides crabs already a mistake. Exactly, exactly. yeah. And I thought, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't trip you up, though. Uh, no, I didn't really answer him. And then he went, and then he just explained that how smart he was about food. Yeah. <laughs> That's something about New York and London, I imagine. Yeah. That no Although matter, this was Summers Point, New Jersey. Uh, Summers Point, New Jersey. <laughs> Obviously a trading ground for New Yorkers. That's, right. That's where they're learning how to be New Yorkers. Let's go down and embarrass the busboy at the crab place first and see how it feels. Right? right? Oh, yeah, I did great. Let's go, let's go get on the train and be tough to somebody. Right. Well, now we're in Manhattan. All right. Here we go. Um, so as you go out to eat, I mean, at, at, at the fancy Michelin star restaurants, a lot of the trade is in the tasting menu. And the, uh, the Michelin critics' alleged behavior, which we have yet to be able to figure out as well as you guys did in the movie. But are you more prone to order tasting menus or a la carte now? Uh, tasting menus. Tasting menus. Tasting, tasting. Yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. And why is that? Because? The experience. Right. The whole, the, you want the whole experience. I mean, if you don't have the time, obviously, it, it depends. But if you're going to go to a restaurant that has that option, you've gone to a really great place, you might as well commit. Well, it would be like going to the theater and say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to see Hamilton, I'd like to see Kinky Boots, please. <laughs> <laughs> when you're there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah, when you're exactly. there, you're like, actually or, tonight Can I skip the second act? I'm really a little tired tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of monologues yeah, right. from an old cow or something, right. that would be good. Right. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I've... I don't know where Hamilton and Kinky Boots came yeah. from. Well, <laughs> How they're random both, they're both angry, fabulous angry, musicals angry, here in New York. So random. <laughs> Brad Bradley's auditioning for one of those two, apparently. <laughs> All right, so that's enough of my questions. Let's hear what you guys have to ask. Start with you. Thank you. Brad, you do an amazing job of... There's a microphone. You do an amazing job of con is it on? conveying your character's complex inner life. How Thank did you, you relate to him personally? What did you draw on inside of you to, to portray uh, him? Well, I mean, I had a tremendous amount of uh, uh, research and, 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 uh, and being able to speak with people in that world. Um, and then, you know, just the script was fantastic. Um, 
And it, if I had to relate to anything, you know that idea of trying to um, to have a goal that you're setting out to do and, and, and an obsession to, to um, do the best you can at that. I can definitely relate to that. Um, but I think the, more than any other character I've played, I really relate, I, I saw how different I was from this guy because he lost the joy in what he did. And, uh, and that's a hell of a thing to lose, as you, I'm sure you can, because food is so joyful. And if you've lost joy in cooking, then wow, you are lost. And that's where he is for so much of the movie. Um, and then characters like Helene really sort of um, re-inject him with the, the thing that he lost back in Paris. I have one question before the rest. My wife wants to know, she knows you didn't shuck a million oysters, but did you shuck 10 of those oysters? Oh, uh, probably 60. Because she said, I saw a lot of arms without any body, so I'm assuming that it was a prep cook. No, no, it was me. It was you. Yeah, there's no double in the whole movie. I told her yeah. so. But in All fact, right. they, they did this thing where we, um, he, the guy loosened about 10 of them in the right? beginning. But we got through them in like seconds. Half a day. Seconds, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, all right, I better go in now." <laughs> and I like, I had this stupid idea that I'd bring the bag out, which wasn't pre. Right. <laughs> right. It looked good though. It looked good. No, no, it was good. But right. it, I mean, yeah. But I was so lucky. That was the first day of shooting, and I mean, as you know, because I have shucked oysters and I was a prep cook, and you, I mean, if you're ever gonna slice your hand, it's it's shucking an oyster. Mm -hmm. And I really thought. I even said to John, well, I said, bro, I mean, just to let you know." This goes south. We got two weeks of post <laughs> We got to, we're, yeah. You better find a lot of other stuff to shoot. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we're glad to each of you for the emotional, for the emotional integrity of your performances. Um, the food aside, the every, I mean, I wanted to throw my microwave out when I came home. But I wanted to ask Ms. Miller and Mr. Cooper, this is a film on many levels of, of recovery and also reinvention. And I'd like to go out of the kitchen for a moment and just both of you talk about how you saw your character and going through the different phases, particularly Mr. Cooper with the recovery. It was not just from substance abuse, it was from a lot of other things too. Um, well, in terms of what I was just commenting on before, you know, I think that we find this guy, he's white knuckling it, you know, he, he, he pitches to Tony, you know, how he has all the answers and he knows exactly what he's going to do. Um, but he has absolutely no clue, really, because he's the same guy he was, just minus um, all the things that he did to inoculate himself from his emotions. So you're sort of watching this guy just actually spiral even further and further down uh, in the movie, the way that I saw it. Um, for me, um, <clears throat> I, I think I really, I really liked this, the humanity of this character and, the, and how honest it was. Um, She's a single mother, she's doing her best, she's passionate about cooking, but she's, she's juggling a lot of balls and everything seems to be compromised at a certain point and she's, she's trying her best. And I just think that it was, you know, I wanted it to be a very real person. I didn't want to wear makeup or kind of portray it in any inauthentic way possible because the women that I've met that work in these kitchens, it's a very male dominated environment. They have to be really tough and strong and, and you know, she's got, she's got depth and she's got pain and, um, and I just, I, it resonated. I thought the uh, movie had a lot, it was very much like a sports film in another way, mm. in that it had this sort of arc of, you know, the comeback story, the competition. Did any of you feel the same way? And did you at all think about it in terms of that sort of, uh, and you, of course, experienced it with the, the chef television shows and all. Could you talk about the com competitive side of the film and how you guys thought about it? And did you get passionately into that competition uh, you know, it's funny you say that. You know, we did, and in no way would I ever compare it to the to Hoosiers, and, and that movie is unbelievable. <laughs> but, but we were talking about. You know, I loved when Gene Hackman, you know, moved to this town, living in Barbara Hershey's house, and like helping her. Sort of, you know, walks out when she's tilling the field at one point in the middle of the winter, and you just realize that he's just so not in his element. You know, where where was he before? And we talked about that specific aspect of the character, because that character is a little similar to, to Adam Jones, actually, in a way, what his arc. But yeah, it's very much, you know, I mean, the Reese character, you have this nemesis, this other guy who's competing and hiding just how competitive one is. But then we see that little sort of slice of his personal life when he's completely destroying his restaurant just because of a decent review that his uh, old partner got. Yes, ma'am. You. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There's a beautiful connection between creating a meal and creating a relationship, and I thought that was just really lovely in the film. Oh, wow. um, also, sense memory when you eat a specific meal. 
I was wondering what your favorite meals are that might draw a sense memory out for you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard. We've obviously been answering a lot of food questions, and, um, and there are so many different types of foods, but for me, there's something really comforting about my mum's roast chicken. <laughs> And I'm, um, yesterday, I had um, a fried black rice, and I'm half Spanish. I know that from Spain, my mom does that a lot too. And uh, but that's it was spectacular in a restaurant called Stella. Estella, yeah, yeah. Boah, the crispy fried black rice is just. <laughs> yeah, I guess a classic uh, Sunday roast. It's always, mm. always kind of something that kind of reminds you of home and comfort and being a child, I guess, which is lovely, yeah. Um, you know, the thing about food is, if you, if you throw out a, but if you throw out any food, I'll tell you what the memory is. I mean, that's the, that's the great thing. It really is true. Sunday I mean, gravy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, grandmother, um, uh, actually, uh, pulling it out of the freezer and freezing my hand, because it was so cold, because we used to freeze the gravy, you know, for the week. We'd make it on, she would make it on Sunday, and then we'd just stack the, the freezer with it. I think that's the thing about food, though. That's, that's, it's just so much more than eating for me. And I think for anyone who appreciates it and like, lives to eat, which somehow all of us pretty much do, but we, the idea of like, everybody getting together around food and what that does for relationships and friendships, and it's like kind of the most joyful thing about being alive. So it's a difficult question to answer, you know, because well, of Well, the that. family meal share was probably the most crystallized moment when you were finally on the team. Right. That was when everyone realized, oh yes, he's gonna have dinner with us. And, <laughs> and there was a satisfaction on the whole team, very much like when you have dinner with your family and everyone all, this, all of a sudden shows up, oh wow, we're all here, this is something really remarkable. And nutrition becomes more than just comestible, it becomes emotional and there's something yeah. to that in the shared experience, particularly when you go through a, a dinner service and work so hard together with people you don't even have to love every day, but you need them then. And then at the end, you can look back at each other and say, yeah, we did it. We just kicked Do you do that at your restaurants? Yeah, always. Yeah, because uh, I never had that experience. We never had the family meal. We forever. have, uh, we have in, in all of our restaurants, because we're lunch and dinner, we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner family meals. Oh, that's and amazing. And you just stop in. So and the late dinner family meal is like the 1230 leftover bits of steak put in the pasta with everything. And right. that's the best one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, Mario, this question is for you, but the other members of the cast can uh, add in as well. When it's, after an entire day of working with very expensive ingredients and all, all sorts of fancy techniques, when a chef goes home and cooks for himself, what does he like to eat? I like very simple things, and, I, and it's almost always based on product as opposed to technique. So uh, a simple duck egg from the farm market, over easy with a slice of fontina, and as it is in season right now, some shavings of white truffle. Just make you feel like, yes, I'm alone, but I'm the king of alone. <laughs> and that's, you know, for me it's the simple stuff, or whatever, you make a quesadilla and you put some interesting stuff on it that you've got. Leftovers play a big part of, our, of my favorite things to eat, because you're not going to sit there and grill a whole steak at 1 o'clock in the morning. But if they'd had steak at the dinner table at the house, because I'm home at 6 o'clock every night for dinner, and then I go back to work. So I know what there's in the fridge when I'm thinking about what I might make when I get home. Wow. What do you think about the whole thing about chefs being rock stars these days? And are any of you enamored with, with chefs that you felt like, oh my god, you know, this is somebody really cool that I'd like to meet? Well, when I started, when I became a chef in 1978 in New Brunswick, New Jersey at Stuff Your Face Restaurant, <laughs> cooking was what you did after you got out of the army before you went to jail. Because it was, it was a task that anybody could do, peel potatoes or be a part of that world. And in the subsequent 30 years, as we've watched, food has become more than just something you ate on your way to the theater or after the game or between something and the opera. Food became the centerpiece. And it's, whether it's because it's entertaining to watch people cook or entertaining to go to their restaurants, we've elevated the players, whether it's the winemaker or the chef or the maitre d' or the, bartender, the mixologist or whatever, they're all been elevated because it's really fun and really relaxing to watch someone who really knows what they're doing do it, even if you never intend to ever do it just like that, like porn. You just happen to watch it and 
I might never do it like that, but I'll probably watch it again. And it's the same thing with food, like the whole fascination with nutrition and satisfaction come together in one place. And it's a fascinating thing. So of course chefs are, but I think that the next rock stars are gonna be like the farmers. Who allows the chefs to be the greatest? It's the one who produces that particular gem lettuce or that kind of oyster or this delicious kind of beef or this magnificent chicken that tastes so much better than all the chicken you ever tasted. And their ascendancy, I think, is imminent. That's because we need to understand that we need to get back into our agriculture a little bit and that heroism will be remunerated by paying them the proper amount to get a really good chicken. Anybody else? But do you think also the, uh, uh, the, the term rock star, just this, when I was just doing research, you know, that White Heat, that cookbook yeah. that came out about that, that this Marco photog White. Yeah, that the photographer had taken this a bunch of photographs of this oh, young chef. Amazing. And there's that one photograph where he looks like Jim Morrison with the cigarette. Cigarette deck. hanging down. Yeah. And a sturgeon on his lap. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, and, and, and you just think, oh, there's this sort of, you know, this, this, this mythical figure. Right. So it really was like a moment in time. Well, when people saw that, they suddenly thought, hey, maybe being a chef is kind of cool. Right, exactly. Because before it that, it changed. wasn't. Before no. that, it was in the back of the house. It was house. the hat that's like It was ugly, five dirty. Feet tall. You know, right, exactly. Yeah. Or, or the guy in the, you know, in the Italian guy t-shirt smoking a cigarette out by the dumpster. Right. What's up for dinner tonight? Right. <laughs> right. And to have a guy like that talk about food in such a passionate right. way, I'm like, you're like, oh, that, that was like a whole new Well, that thing. was my first real mentor at Marco Pierre White, and I remember just thinking, the world is now suddenly something far more interesting. Yeah. He would take little tagliatelle and take oysters and put them in a little bit of the broth with a little bit of butter and then caviar and some raspberry vinaigrette and then put it back in the shell and put it under the gratinage. And you're like, mom never made spaghetti like that. <laughs> and this it, was guy, so, it was so intoxicatingly interesting. And this is a guy who got three stars and ha at that time had never cooked in France. Right. Which was like, and he was English born, cuisine. never been to France. Yeah. And First got three English stars. English born guy for three stars. Yeah. And the youngest at that And the time. youngest, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this question is for the movie cooks on the stage. Uh, being around food so much while you were making the movie, did any of you gain weight? And, <laughs> and if you did, uh, what did you do to lose the weight or to not gain the weight in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I think we all had to be pretty careful about kind of the amount of butter that was on set and... Uh, all that kind of stuff, because you constantly, I think, like, they're constantly eating the chefs, they're constantly tasting, constantly kind of, and, you know, myself and Sienna were by a particularly I tasty station. I was drinking beef sauce. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. It was, it's basically butter, but it was so, I just it was amazing. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just have to be, had to be careful with it, yeah. <laughs> At the same time, you're then you're you're working so intensely, and it's it's physically really exhausting to be in that environment. It's boiling hot, so the kind of anxiety and adrenaline and focus that yes. that takes is probably burning off the beef sauce. <laughs> uh, I had I was in the process of losing uh, weight to do a play, um, and so I was trying to lose like forty pounds for the Elephant Man. So it was kind of a nightmare <laughs> to do a cooking movie in between. But if you do watch the film, again, uh, uh, you get, you'll see scenes where my face is like two inches wider than other times. Because <laughs> we shot out a sequence. <laughs> but it was kind of nice. He was lumbering. And, I don't know. It felt, and I'm glad that I had that, that, that weight, actually. Um, it worked, I thought. I gained two pounds watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the red, ma'am. Hi, this question is for uh, Sienna, Bradley, and Uma. What were you, uh, what scene or, or part of the movie do you think was the biggest challenge and, and what, what was the most fun? The biggest challenge for me was um, the scene where Bradley and I had that confrontation where he called me an infection. <laughs> um, there was just something about the atmosphere on that day and I think having worked together so intensely on American Sniper and we'd sort of got to a level of trust with each other as actors where we could just kind of get quite deep quite quickly. And um, it, it felt very intense, very real. And I think it kind of, it, it just really affected the environment. And um, one of those things, it was kind of cathartic and very interesting and very dark, but, but hard to go through that with someone, that, you know, with your friend. And then uh, we had this kind of enough of a good relationship and of a good understanding of each other to be able to avoid each other for the rest of the day without having to apologize or explain why. But it was it was just a pretty real moment. Um, 
And then at the end of your day, you're like, that was a great day, because that's the weird thing about being an actor. Like, the horrible stuff is what makes you feel good. Um, <laughs> but, I, but the best part of it for me was the training and, and learning these skills and being around this incredible cast. We all became really close, and we laughed a lot. And we worked in a kitchen. We were chefs, and we really did it. There was no doubles, as Bradley said. And, and to have that experience of really living another profession is, is one of the most exciting things of our job, I think. I, mean, I just had one scene, so, <laughs> well, well, three, you know, <laughs> but anyway, it was a pleasure, it was just fun, I just enjoyed myself. Um, yeah, that scene was pretty brutal, um, uh, with Uma, um, I <laughs> 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 yeah, cried the whole that time, one. The second half of the day, <laughs> um, uh, I think the scene with Matthew Reese was probably the, the was the most shocking one. That's at the end of the movie when he shows up uh, um, at his nemesis restaurant. Um, it was late at night, and we didn't have much time. And uh, and the bag thing just sort of happened in one of the takes. And then, you know, it, it just feels vulnerable when you're doing something like that in front of twelve people that you don't know at all. The chefs in the, in, in in Reese's restaurant. Uh, but ultimately, it was beautiful because uh, <clears throat> Reese, Matthew Reese, who plays Reese, was just incredible, and we didn't really know each other at all. And then, next thing you know, he's uh, you know caressing me and trying to calm me down. I mean, it was really kind of, and we're bonded forever. As a matter of fact, I haven't really seen him since, and uh, I look forward to seeing him tonight because we just we looked at each other after, and we're just it was like why we do why we both love doing what we do is to be able to. Uh, to really put yourself in imaginary circumstances and, and, and hope that accidents like putting a bag on your head and realizing you can kill yourself uh, happen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I had no idea when I, until I saw the movie about this idea of food trends that, you know, you can come back after a few years and everybody will say, the way you were preparing that's all wrong today. We're doing it all differently. So I wanted to know from the actors if there were uh, any food trends today that you sort of dislike or hate or think are stupid? And for um, Sienna and Uma, uh, being fashionable people that you are, uh, your aesthetics about fashion, how do trends influence that? I think it's very important to avoid trends. Um, uh, but, you know, that's just because I'm me, because I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really follow kind of like, oh, that's the cool thing to wear. And, you know, I sort of have an aesthetic that I like. I'm sure it's the same as everyone sitting at this table. You know, you kind of wear what you think is nice and what makes you feel good. And food trends, um, no, I think I'd try anything. I, there's nothing that, that I feel, I, I, first of all, I'm not particularly aware of them. Um, well, the sous vide, I think that food is, yeah, I think sous vide stuff is delicious, but I also like barbecue stuff, so. Hey, guys, congratulations on the movie. I really loved it. It's like a great mix of, like, a dramatic film and, like, chef's table-esque food scenes that look beautiful. Uh, I wish there were more movies like this to watch. Um, you know, a lot of us won't get the chance to talk to somebody like Marco or Marcus. I was wondering if, seeing you talked a little bit about the, the tips and the tricks that you learn as a chef. There was, if there was one thing that you'll take away from this set as far as a food hack or a kitchen tip that you'll be using for the rest of your days, and maybe Daniel about getting a table. And, uh, and Bradley, I love how you treated the suite in the Langham. Uh, is that mimic at all how you, you are with your real hotel rooms, with uh, room service everywhere and all that? Uh, no, I'm the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, not like, yeah, I would feel horrible if uh, I'd left a room like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, spoon, we were talking about this yesterday. You know, I always thought Spoon was the sort of bastard utensil, uh, but, uh, bastard child on the utensil, uh, but um, it's the most, um, it's the optimal, uh, most worthwhile and uh, an essential element to any cook if they're going to cook. And I did not know that before. And also, the great thing, I, I loved, uh, Mar I, I got to, Marco and Gordon talked about plating food and just, you know, once you make a choice, live with it. Don't, if, if you ever see a chef, you know, sort of, and then, uh, you're, it's over. Yeah. It's like, and, and they were so clear about that when I was plating food in the movie. I thought that was really interesting, you know. See, have your vision, you know, improvise with it, and then that's it. Would you agree with that? Oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. Once you second guess yourself in any craft, you're, yeah, you're yeah. gone, you're done. Yes, ma'am. If, if there was one 
Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I, yeah, I think um, I just learning, being taught how to cook fish, which is, which is like a simple, delicious thing, but really easy to get wrong. And I now have a pretty solid and well-rehearsed <laughs> technique as to how to cook fish pretty well, and it's impressive <laughs> at a dinner party. So that's nice. Hi. Um, one of the things that keep coming up in the movie is that there, I would say there's a lot of um, emphasis placed on pride, respect, and validation for one's work. And um, this is a two-part question. If any of the uh, cast members wants to uh, answer this, what gives, who or what gives you validation or pride in your work? And it could, the second part of the question is, uh, can you talk about John Wells' directing style in this very you know, interesting movie? I, I personally, I'd say being able to uh, having a, a good day's work. I'd say feeling like I have given it my all, and uh, being with people like the people up here, and feeling that we actually created something together. That that that's that gives me great fulfillment. Um, and somebody like John Wells creates an environment where that can happen. Uh, for example, we were, when I was just mentioning the scene with Matthew Reese, I mean, you have to have a very um, a director that knows exactly what he or she wants and is and is really inviting the collaborative uh, experience. Which is my my for me, all the years that I've worked, the best directors are the ones who are the most collaborative always. And and he was like that, and always willing to hear from everybody, and treated every single person with the same value. It was the guy who was a, a real cook who was in the back. If he had an idea, he would listen to it just as much as if I said something. And that's a, those aspects of a director, that you, you want to gravitate towards people like that. Yeah, I think it's, it, the validation question is complicated because it's, uh, I think if, um, you know, it, it just, de it depends, you know. It's, um, it really has to come from somewhere in you. And I've, I've certainly had experiences in the past where I felt like, on that particular day, maybe I didn't show up to the degree that I wish I had. Mm. And uh, it's hard to feel fulfilled regardless of what the response is to that. I think you really have to know that you've done everything you can to put everything you can into what you're working on and that that in itself is validation because ultimately it is a question of taste and these things do ebb and flow and people like stuff and don't. And I read reviews of films that I adore and they're terrible and vice versa. It's just not personal. It's, you know, everybody has their own opinions. So I think you have to kind of turn down the noise on too much praise or criticism and just do your best. I find it other actors um, and other creative people in films too, but when another actor um, is nice to you, <laughs> uh, it's very, uh, very moving. You know, you're sort of surprised, like, oh, really? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, sort of, it's people who really understand what it's like. It's most, most impactful sometimes. Finding truth in moments as well is always a, a lovely thing. Like, you know, it could be a look, it could be anything, you know, but if it's a genuine thing, mm. you guys will feel that, and as a result, it will resonate off you, and then the audience will feel it. And I think that in itself, even if it's not fireworks, is validation enough to make you go, I'm doing my job yeah. right, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic. Two more questions. In the back, ma'am. Uh, yes, Mario, this question is for you. You spoke on the um, three-star Michelins. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how does one become one and what are the aspects of becoming a, you know, after they become one, what makes the judges so great in their critiques? Well, the Michelin Guide is very anonymous. We never know who they are, and they, they present it a little bit in the movie like they could have kind of figured it out, and maybe in Europe it's a little bit different, but the Michelin Guide in America is is a little harder to figure out mm -hmm. because like Del Posto has one star, and the Spotted Pig have one star. So if you come from another town, and you're using the book, and you're thinking, well, I just went to the Del Posto, let me go to the Spotted Pig, you might be surprised, or <laughs> even discomforted by it. <laughs> because it's an entirely different experience. So the judging is something we're always trying to figure out, and you know, we don't, we don't really get to question them. But it's certainly a prize, and one of the things that we do in the restaurant business is if we're not treated well in a guidebook, we tell all our friends, no one reads that book, who cares? <laughs> but if you're in the book, oh yeah, this is probably one of the most influential books. <laughs> in the world. So we're always trying to crack it, but the, at the end of the day, what, and, and it goes back to the validation question, we're really cooking for ourselves in our kitchen, and we're really just trying to figure out how to share that experience in the best way that 
We find it exciting knowing and paying attention to every cook in the world and finding out what they're doing and what's going on in the ingredients. And a lot of customers come in and they don't really care about any information at all. They want something to eat, they really want to talk with their friends, and they really don't want to talk to a waiter or hear about the chef's passions because they're just there for something. Mm -hmm. So finding a way to bridge all of those options is having great front of the house staff who can read the customer and say, these people are really interested, maybe you want to go talk to them. Or maybe these people don't really want to hear about anything, don't go near their table, like they're busy. <laughs> And that's kind of what the guidebook kind of rewards, is our ability to make that experience seamless for any level of different kinds of groups of people that come in. But fundamentally, we're cooking for ourselves, and we're building a restaurant so that we are most impressed with what we do. And you know, that's the validation when we look, and other chefs come in and say, wow, that was a good thing. That was a great thing. Yeah. Last one, ma'am in the back. Yes, uh, for the cast members, what kind of tippers are you? <laughs> and Mario, what do you think? Let's hear about the tippers first. <laughs> I'll bet you these are all very good tippers. England is really bad with tipping. It's just not in any way a part of the culture that it is here. And it's, it's um, often it's included, but it would be 10%. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if it's not, you know, you, you can be as generous as you want, but but like in a taxi, you don't have to tip. It's very, it's just different. I guess the wages are maybe higher, and that doesn't balance out the same. But here, like, yeah, you, it, that's that's where people make their money is on tips. So you better be conscious of that. Yeah, same in Germany. It's ten percent. So it always takes me a day until I understand. I always get these strange looks. <laughs> the first day I'm here, it's like, <laughs> oh no! As, as as soon as the American waiter hears a European accent, they're like, oh, uh, here's one for the house. <laughs> and and to that answer, that's why Danny Meyer is taking this on because what they're doing is they're changing the minimum wage. It used to be that you could pay a waiter four or five dollars an hour, and they would still make seventy or eighty or a hundred thousand dollars a year because they were be being remunerated by great tips. The idea of the good side of that is that you'll work hard because good tips are clearly a part of good service. The other side is that the whole team's working just as hard, and, 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 and in a team player guy like Danny Meyer, it would seem that everyone should share in the upside and that they should all be a part of it. It's a way of, Danny's trying to get his hands around and his head around keeping the restaurant business sustainable, meaning that the business can profit and continue to do what it does in any way against the different kinds of things that are changing in the world while we try to figure out how to equitably distribute any kind of money for the people that are deserving of it. So it's a double-sided knife and a three-sided coin and a five-sided conundrum. <laughs> and, and, and he came out first and that takes a lot of balls and I, and, and, I'm, and I look forward to seeing how he figures it out. Of course, my team's been working on this for five months, but we were not prepared to come out as the leader of the pack in this one. We've got to really think this out and really kind of do town hall meetings, not only with our staff, but with our customers to figure out exactly what they think is good. I would say if there's the first one, that would be the easiest one to do because it's a prefix menu there. Del Posto will probably be the first one that follows some kind of a line of what we're going to call servizio incluso. <laughs> <laughs> yes, last question. To follow up on your question. Yes. Bradley, you've come out in support of Jennifer Lawrence's comments about wage equality for women, which actually kind of parallels your character's growth in, your, in his relationship to women treating them as equals. Would you like to comment on that, on stepping forward? Congratulations to you on that. Uh, well, I don't, well, I mean, I don't, Thank you, but I don't. I don't. There's nothing to really congratulate. It was just sort of. Um, I mean, if anybody's congratulated, Sienna, um, who took a stand, a very huge stand. Um, not to put you on the spot. Anyway, <laughs> uh, no. All I was saying was that um, it's a tricky thing to talk about money. I'm never aware what anybody else gets unless you're approached uh, to give some of your money because there. You know, to make a movie is getting harder and harder and people are paying less and less and people are always taking pay cuts. That's my experience. So the only time you ever find out about somebody else is if you have to divvy up the pie differently so someone will come on and do it. But, you know, you're not aware of what other people are getting also. So why not just be transparent and say, okay, if here's the pie, let's divvy it up and let's just be, let's talk about it. I mean, wage equality is unassailable, just like marriage equality is unassailable. These are things that in 40 years we'll look back and be like, wow, I that's just like not letting people on the bus. So it's, it's inevitably that it's going to happen. It's just a question of who's going to take the heat on the first day or the first prize, and then it'll all kind of settle out. It has to. It's natural. It will be equilibrium. Thank you all.
ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!